Very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's ULaw webinar. Today's webinar has been accredited for one hour of professionalism CPD credits in the provinces of Ontario, British Columbia, and New Brunswick. And the topic for today's webinar is Trust and Gender Reconciliation Demystified. Once again, I repeat, for one hour of professionalism CPD credits in the province of Ontario, British Columbia, and New Brunswick, and the title is Trust and General Reconciliation Demystified. Please use that topic and uh, you would be able to get your one hour of credits when you register on your appropriate Law Society websites. Now, like every other ULaw webinar, today's webinar does have a specific agenda, more so because of the CPD nature in itself. Specifically, we'll talk about the reconciliation process, the trust and general reconciliation as it pertains to your law firm's situation. Some firms may have trust and general. Some firms may only have the general um, rec you know, accounts for their business. So really, depending on your business situation, both of them would apply. And what is the expectation from the law society in when either you're getting audited or on a general basis, what is the expectation from you as a legal professional regarding the reconciliation process? That's something we're going to talk about. And towards the last 15 to 20 minutes of today's presentation, I'll be using the ULaw product as an example to walk you through the reconciliation process and where does it get its data from, and we'll go through a quick live demo of the reconciliation process, okay? At any given time, please feel free to use the chat window to ask any questions regarding today's webinar. And uh, both myself and my support staff would be more than happy to answer those questions. Now we want to talk initially before I get into the actual reconciliation process, once again, pretty much highlight kind of a brief history, if you will, of the accounting systems. You know, beginning from a manual double entry system, the accounting world has, of course, evolved and matured, of course, based on requirement changes, based on um, the business evolution from a manual double entry system, which was a very time consuming and extremely manual labor intensive process to where we are today, at a, especially around the legal tech side, to have an evolved legal accounting software. So you've gone from a manual paper-based double entry system through a one write system to the more general accounting software that we're all used to, to a legal accounting system that specifically focuses on the nature of the legal business around trust managing money in advance, making sure that it's done in the legal right way, the ledgers, journals, and the reconciliation process as well managed and maintained. So just so that you appreciate where technology has evolved to help legal professionals today with the opportunity that you have to capitalize and make use of these systems to work for you. But having said that, there is certainly work to be done. There are certain important components of that system that you still have to help. For example, the data entry itself. So for any of these systems to work, whether it's a manual system that you use today or if it's a very sophisticated legal accounting software that you use, the fundamental of all these systems is the data in itself. And the need for you as a legal professional and a business owner to enter this data in time, either entering it in time or getting caught up. And if you're getting caught up, of course, you have to be then prepared to spend the time that is required to get caught up, depending on the term in itself. If you're just getting caught up for that week, it's a much faster process. If you're getting caught up for two weeks, then, of course, then there's more time required. If you're getting caught up for months together, then, of course, you really have to appreciate and understand 
you know, the bargain here. So if we're willing to get caught up on a daily basis, less time spent, if you have to wait, you know, at least for the end of the month to reconcile, then you certainly have to put the time and effort in to put all the data in. Okay? As you enter this data in, let's assume you've got a retainer from a client. And in, again, assuming that the retainer you appreciate goes into your trust account, that is one transaction that you're required to enter, money entering into your trust account. You do your dockets, you do your disbursements, you generate the invoice, you now transfer the eligible trust amount from the trust account into the general account. Now that is a transaction that's leaving the trust account. And of course, the other side of the world is that that is a transaction where money is getting deposited into your own general account. But purely from a reconciliation process, the Law Society is looking for you to tell your story through these transactions and in the form of ledgers and journals. And, most, and the most important step to make sure that the ledgers and journals are prudent is the step of the reconciliation. And all you have to do in the reconciliation step is to confirm that the transactions that you have entered into your accounting system or manual paper-based system matches with the transactions that have already occurred with the bank, right? So if you really were to look at the bank, when the money goes in, money comes out, of course, there's a financial institution, and I, I shouldn't say bank, but you could have credit unions, you could have any financial institution behind the scene where those transactions get transacted in real time. Right? So the reconciliation process is that where you compare what you've entered. I've got that retainer. Here's the $1,000. Is that reflected in the bank? Or do the dates match? If the dates don't match, then entering the appropriate dates where you've captured into your system, when did that reflect in the bank? Maybe there is a line item of a transaction that shows in your bookkeeping system but not, has not yet reflected in the bank or the other way around where it shows in the bank. For example, if let's say you have deposited, you've got the check from the client, you've deposited the retainer, and hence it's going to reflect within a day or two within the financial institution's record keeping. But let's say you failed to enter it into the bookkeeping system or write it down then either the chances of you being forgotten or if you've not entered it is likely. So the reconciliation process is also a great way to get caught up on any transactions that you've either failed to deposit into the bank or failed to enter into your system. Okay. Now, once you have done that process of reconciling, so comparing your books, comparing it to the bank, and confirming whether those transactions exist and don't exist. The next step is to generate as an outcome of that reconciliation process, the reconciliation report, or what's called as a trust reconciliation report. And that's what you have on your screen right now. And that reconciliation report, trust reconciliation report, consists of four important data sets. Okay, again, these data sets come from the day-to-day -day transactions that you have entered into your system. The first data set is having an understanding of the balance in your bank. Okay, so what is your current balance for trust? With all the trust money that's come in, let's say you're reconciling for the end of August. As of 31st of August or 28th of August, whenever you reconcile, what is the balance in your bank? It's just, of course, an accumulation of all the trust money that there is in that account. Okay? Step two. I mentioned about there could be an anomaly where there's either or you have not yet entered into the system or you have not yet deposited into the bank. So step two is catching those anomalies. 
which is what are the outstanding deposits or checks that you know of at the end of that month or end of that reconciliation period and what does that add up to? Because that is going to tell the story as to why there is a difference between the balance that your books are telling you about and the balance that your bank is telling you about. Okay, so if a transaction reflects in the book, let's say you've said, I've got that $2,000 retainer, but you left that retainer check in your wallet or you left it in your office or your home office and you forgot to deposit into the bank for whatever reason, I'm sure you appreciate that the bank is going to show $2,000 less compared to what your books are saying. And hence, when you reconcile at the end of the 28th, it's going to say $2,000 more on your books, $2,000 less. And let's say even if you deposited that check right now, it's not going to reflect within that time period, then you tell this reconciliation report and the auditors through this reconciliation process saying, here are my outstanding deposits. Likewise, if you have written a trust check and the other party on the other side has not yet deposited that check into their account, whether it's a real estate transaction, whether it's any other form of business, then that's an outstanding check on their end. Okay, So it could be where you have not deposited or the other party has not deposited. All of that is now captured in the second data set. Okay? Now, the third data set, which is very important, is the individual listing of the balance in each of the client's trust account. So let's say you have five clients and they've all given you the trust money. And depending on the stage and nature of the matter, you could have a single matter where you've not yet even started anything and hence the entire trust amount could be in that client's trust balance. You could have another client where you've pretty much finished all the work. Maybe there's another $200, $300 left. That could be a situation. So you pretty much add up all the files of the clients that you have and their outstanding trust balances with the last activity date. This is data set three. Data set four, of course, is more of an outcome, which is comparing your bank balance for your reconciled trust transactions and the total, comparing it with your bookkeeping system, whether that's manual or software-based, and the balances for your client's trust ledger. Okay? Making sure that the two amounts are the same. And that is the final step of the data set that needs to be reflected in this one single trust reconciliation report. Okay. Now let's say you have a business, you have trust and general, or maybe just the general. There's definite need for reconciling the general account. Typically, there is this... Um, uh, of course, the auditors are looking to scrutinize the trust account much more than the general account. But as a business ownership, if you can reconcile your general account, then you can be very confident about your revenue for your business. If you know that this is the exact amount of money that's entered into your general account and has left it, you have pretty much accounted for the revenue and the expense that has occurred in that particular time period, let's say that month, and hence, when you generate your P&L, your profit and loss for that month, the fact that you reconcile all the transactions that have entered and left the general account, you can feel pretty confident about the P&L. If more revenues come in, there's a profit. If there's more expenses that month, then that's a loss. Right? So it's equally important to have, I would say, a discipline or a structure of how you go about reconciling your general account as well. The slightly added complexity that you have with the general account is, of course, if you have multiple general accounts. Let's say you have a general account, 
you could have a business credit card, right? There is a possibility that you have multiple general accounts, in which case you do this for each of those general accounts that you have for your business. The steps remain to be the same. It's comparing your book with your general bank account, with your financial institution, right? The only difference between the trust and the general is that the general reconciliation only has three data sets. It does not have the client's trust listing. If you look at the previous slide, you can clearly notice that the step three, or the data set three, has the client trust listing, whereas that, of course, is not meaningful in your general reconciliation report. But step one is still your bank balance. Steps two are any outstanding withdrawals or payments. Just like I mentioned, either people have not yet deposited or you have not yet withdrawn or deposited into your financial institution. And step three, um, of course, with between outstanding withdrawals and outstanding deposits, looking at the final bank and or financial institution and your own ledger comparison. Okay? Now, how do you prepare? Okay, there's a quick question that I'd like to uh, address right away. Will we get the copies of the slides? Absolutely. Now, we don't share the slides itself, but this entire webinar is being recorded and will be available to you on our YouTube channel as early as Monday next week. So, of course, this entire uh, demonstration would have these slides in them as well. So you can always replay it and watch it. Now, the three important pieces of information that we believe that is really required to start that reconciliation process is number one is the date in itself. So you have to be very particular about what is that cutoff date? What is that date of reconciliation? So let's say for the month of August, are you reconciling all the transactions on or before, let's say, the 27th or 28th of August? Right. Typically, it's a monthly reconciliation report is what the Law Society recommends. There are, of course, tools, including the few law and other tools in the industry that allow you to reconcile on a more periodic basis. It really comes down to your style of doing business, the number of transactions that you have in your business, and the kind of help that you have um, in your business. Okay. So number one, of course, is the date of reconciliation. The number two information that you need, piece of information that you require, is when you open up your financial institution and understand the balance as of that particular date of reconciliation. So as of the 28th or 27th of August, what was the balance in my trust account? Or what was the balance in my general account? Okay. The third is if you're using a manual system to compare your own ledgers with the financial institutions, then you need some way, like either written or in an Excel sheet if you've moved on, or if you're using an accounting system that highlights and brings out each of those transactions as you have recorded with the date and an amount. If you have a description against it, even better, so that you can now quickly appreciate what was that $32.45 for? Okay, The sooner you capture, the faster it is because your memory is fresh and you pretty much know, oh yes, that was for that particular application fee or whatever that reason may be. Or maybe it was a... Um, disbursement, a trust disbursement that you use for fax or paper or postage. So the sooner you can capture these transactions and compare them against the financial institutions, the better it is for you so that you don't have to remember each of these, accumulate all of those at the end of the month. And we'll look into that at the end of today's session as to how you can go about doing that. But with just these three pieces of information, the date, you have the final balance of that date and the transactions that have transpired in that time period that have not yet been reconciled. 
these are the three transaction uh, pieces of information you need. And of course, without it goes without saying that you do need access to your financial institutions transactions. Today, of course, everyone's going down the online way. So if you have your account with TD, RBC, or any other credit union, they do offer the transactions being available online. So you just log in into your online account, choose that date time period, and it would pretty much show you in a chronological ascending and descending order of your date all the transactions. Some institutions do give you a bit of description of what that transaction is. Most of them do end up giving you kind of a reference number, if you will, of that transaction. And that is why it is very important to use your bookkeeping system to give you this level of description. So when you enter that transaction, when you enter that retainer, just don't enter a retainer. Use this as a way to expand on it so that you can quickly remember the retainer was for which matter, which file. If you're doing a disbursement or if you're doing, let's say, a payout from trust, make sure that you explain as much as possible. If you're using gender reconciliation as an example, this is a very common mistake when people pay for expenses. Making sure you use the accounting system, whichever may be, once again, to expand on the reason behind that expense. Right? It was $86.44 in Tim Hortons. That could be anything. You know? So if you can use that system when you enter it to say that 8644 was towards an office expense that was paid to, let's say, a certain marketing effort that you had. That makes it easier for you to, in its true sense, reconcile with what that transaction was about. Of course, if you see that 8644 in your bank, even better. Where the problem arises is if you don't, and now you have to scamper for what was that 8644 about. Okay, so helping yourself, the best way to do that is use that description as a way to explain the nature of that each and every transaction. Okay, so now we talk about, all right, here are fast and easy. Here are the reconciliation processes. It's everything that you capture as part of the reconciliation steps, the reconciliation report. Now the question really is, why reconcile? How does that help you? Of course, it's a law society requirement, but more than it being a requirement, we believe the reconciliation process, even from an audit perspective, um, loves you and it's designed to pretty much catch two specific issues that every legal firm has. And in this particular matter, we're all the same or you're all the same. One is, as I mentioned, it allows you to catch all the transactions that you have in your accounting system, manual, paper-based, or automated software that do not match with your financial institution's records. And the second item is vice versa. There are transactions in your financial institution that do not reflect in your accounting system. Okay? Let's consider a situation where you're reconciling for the end of the month and your trust reconciliation shows you that you have $2,000 more in your financial institution. It does not reflect. That means that maybe there's a retainer, for example, that you've not yet entered into the system. Maybe you've done the right thing of depositing that check right away, but it does not reflect in your accounting system. Now, what that ends up is that's an easy fix. Because you can go into your accounting system, of course, catch up to say which, you know, if it's $2,000, you really need to know which file. And that's why if you get caught up more regularly, it's easier to do that. But let's say you have caught up and you know that it's for, you know, James White and that particular file. You can write it in, and once the transaction is now available, 
you reconciled it. What's harder to reconcile is, let's say you have that check in your hand. You have it in the second situation where, or rather the first situation where you actually have entered it, but you failed to deposit. For whatever reason, you have not yet deposited that amount. It happens mostly in the general reconciliation. Often clients do a really good job within the trust, recon- trust transactions. But we've seen situations where, for whatever reason, that check has not yet cleared the bank, and hence it does not reflect yet. In those situations, it gets harder, especially when you've come closer to the end of the month and you're reconciling, because that's where you're $2,000 short in your bank. And let's say you do have your check, and now you're going to go and deposit it on Monday, and that's only going to reflect to you after the reconciliation period, then that 2000 needs to be accounted for as an unreconciled transaction in the following month's reconciliation report. So your September reconciliation report would have an August 31st, $2,000, in which case you do have to now leave the $2,000 transaction that has been accounted for in your bookkeeping system as unchecked. I know it's confusing. We'll maybe have a chance to walk through that. The bottom line is the sooner you can reconcile, the faster you can be on top of these two prudent, very practical, pragmatic, transactional errors that can happen within your firm. But let's say you've done that. Here's the reward that you're going to have. If you have reconciled on a monthly basis, given that your accounting system is up to date, so that Friday afternoon, you're going to very have a peaceful coffee. Or if it gets later, your choice of drink. The second most important component is that you're audit ready. Because once you have reconciled, the ledgers and journals are just a reflection of these transactions in a format that is expected by the law societies, whether jurisdictional law societies have their own expectations in terms of template, in terms of documents. But once you've reconciled, then you've made sure that transactions exist. And if they don't exist, you have certainly made sure that you understand the reason why they don't exist. Whether it's an outstanding deposit, outstanding withdrawal, you have clearly articulated the story of what happened in that month with your law firm. The third important aspect, especially if you're reconciling your general account on a monthly basis, is you're ready to file your taxes with the CRA. Okay, And the reason for that, as I mentioned earlier, is having a firm handle on the profit and loss, a firm handle on the revenue and expense. With every reconciliation document, you can be certain of what that monthly revenue is monthly expenses are, and this minus this gives you the profit or loss. And based on the profit or loss is where you file your taxes, not only your income tax. If you are scheduled or set up to do provincial taxes, jurisdictional taxes like HST, PST, GST, for the amount of, let's say, taxes that you've paid and received, received from your client, paid on behalf of your firm for expenses that you've incurred. Reconciling on a monthly basis allows you to stay on top of your HST in the province of Ontario, for example. How much have you received? How much have you paid? How much do you owe the government? Or how much should you get as returns back from the government? Whether it's a monthly payment for your HST, quarterly, Whatever the schedule you're set up for, you're set up for success as long as you have the reconciliation done. These are our top three reasons and the rewards that you get for doing a very regular reconciliation process. Now, as a business owner, you get the remaining three. If, let's say, you're not the business owner and you're just part of or part-time business owner or, let's say, you're a partner in this, 
it still is applicable, but let's say you are truly the business owner and this is a sole practitioner business, then it's even more important for you to appreciate what is my revenue like, where did I get my revenue from, so dividing up that entire revenue based on categories, what were my expenses like for that month, where did I spend the most, how does that compare to my expenses last month, how does it compare to where I was last year? Again, if you're not um, doing a good job of staying on top of your expenses, then it's just pretty much going to be water under the bridge. Um, it's important that you have a good handle on the data sets of your revenue and expense so that you can be a very well-informed business owner, whether investing in marketing avenues to help improve the business or reducing the bottom line to keep afloat. These data sets, what we call analytics, are very important to you as a business owner. Last but not least, all of this added up, as I mentioned earlier, leaves you with a peace of mind that you've done the right thing, you're already audit ready, and you're on top of the game to understand the truth and the reality of the P&L. Sometimes we want to cover our eyes and hope the problems go away. Unfortunately, they don't. And hence, taking your challenge and taking your problem head on by using data to help you and the right tools to provide you that data makes you a smart, well-informed legal professional and a business owner. And reconciling is definitely a good first step. And if you haven't done that, that's okay, because there are easier ways now to get caught up, backdate, reconcile, and get caught up. The two important factors, of course, are time and money. If you've got the time, put the time in to do it. If you have the money, get the help that's needed to get caught up. And both those options are, of course, available. And we certainly believe that if you have reconciled on a regular basis, that you certainly are audit ready from day one. We certainly believe in that. Because as part of that audit, typically what's being asked around the financial transactions or your accounting books are the ledgers, both for trust and general, the journals for both trust and general, and of course there are certain jurisdictional documents that also are transactional based. All these data, they don't come from anywhere else. They come from what you have entered with regards to either data with regards to a client and his or her matter and the file, or it's the data that you've entered on behalf of your business in terms of expense or other revenues that's come in. Right? There's only these two different data sets. And all these documents are just capturing various essence or aspects of those transactions. For example, journals capture what was the method of payment. So somebody paid you a retainer, that's fantastic. You've got the $1,000, but the journal wants to know, did they pay you through a credit card? Did they pay you through a check? What was the method of payment? And Ledger, of course, has is very big on dates. Great, you got the retainer, but hey, we want to know the story about when did you receive it? So that then it's easier for you to have compared it with, um, as part of the reconciliation process, to have already done that. The ledger is just an output document after that. Okay. The fee book, expense book, they all come to, from the transactions. And once you've reconciled, those transactions now automatically become authorized and prudent. So it's not anymore could have happened, may not have happened. Once you've reconciled, hey, you've done it, you've seen the bank, you know that it's happened or not happened. Okay? So as long as you reconciled these documents that are needed for you to be audit ready, because that's what's going to be asked. Give me the you know, general ledger for May. Reconciliation report and my general ledger for May. Here it is. As long as I reconciled May before the end of May, you can always go back in time and generate these documents, okay? And shouldn't take much of your time. 
And what is important for you to build a structure or a discipline towards entering this data and having all the data available goes back to the fundamentals. Having a certain process to how you manage your fees, your disbursements, your retainers. Some firms have a policy for retainer top-ups, and if you do do that, ensuring that you're entering those payments or retainer payments as and when they come. Establishing a fee structure, especially if this is going to be a contingency fee or a flat fee, ensuring that you have a well written out engagement or retainer letter that dictates the timeline with which you generate invoices. Are you going to be generating invoices as and when dockets happen? Are you going to be doing that on a time period basis? So every month we're going to accumulate all the transactions that have pretty much transpired that month. We have law firms that pretty much uh, for corporate law, or let's say you're working with another law firm, they would have 20 to 30 matters that they work on that month. They don't invoice as and when they finish transactions for each matter. They wait for the end of the month and they accumulate all the invoices based on all the transactions across the 30, 40 matters they work in that month. If that is your situation and if that's your business strategy, then it's very, very important that you enter the data or have someone enter the data for you on a timely manner. Either do it right away, end of that day, or if you're going to get caught up, at least plan to get caught up that week. Because that would lead to the next aspect, which is the invoice balance. So making sure you're following up to get payments, depending on your payment terms. And that's important for your general reconciliation. So if you set up for net 15 or net 30, net 7, then the general reconciliation would reflect upon that. Yes, the month of August is not great, but that's because I've generated quite a few invoices in August, and they would not get what they call as received as payments till September. So you can very well plan ahead, knowing that, yes, it's a lost month for August, let's say, but you can anticipate that you should expect a phenomenal September month because you're going to receive the payments for all those invoices that were generated in August. Because for all practical purposes, it's a 30 net, say, net 30 or net 15 payment term. So if you generated an invoice August 25th, you should expect that payment in September, and that will reflect in your reconciliation report in September. So ensuring you have a good fee structure that relates to the schedule of your invoices automatically relates to the schedule and time period in which you should receive the payments. Okay, Those will be the top two. And if you do have a firm that manages trust money, very important that you capture those transactions, balance it on a weekly basis if you can, if not a month. And the final segue is, given today's day and time, given the advent of legal tech, it does not hurt to invest and explore the use of tools to help you alleviate the pain point, to alleviate the time that is required to do this. And more than the time, it's also the process that helps you deal with such numbers. Often we're not comfortable with numbers. Often we're not comfortable with what those numbers reflect in terms of reality. And hence, as I mentioned earlier, there is this sense of, I don't like this and hence I'm not going to do it. But rather than being caught up on the emotion of these numbers, if you can just get caught up on the discipline that's required to stay Honest your business and audit ready. If you go with that emotion, then the numbers would not bother you as much. If there is a component of business ownership and what that means, but if you can help yourself build that discipline saying, if I can do this on a weekly basis, half my headache is gone at the end of the month, that helps you 
to build that discipline. And if you have a software or a system that can do the calculation, that can allow you to be faster in reconciling those accounts on a weekly basis, then even better. So the value proposition that we're selling is not specifically to purchase a product, but to consider the option of exploring purchasing a software product that's best suited for your firm that can help you relieve the amount of time and effort that you put in today to do these reconciliation processes. Okay. And of course, one important component is the data entry itself. Whether you use a manual system or the most sophisticated system, that system is as good as the data that's in it. But let's say all things equal, if you have actually entered it into a manual system and you've done the same effort of entering it into a software, you can be rest assured that the room for error the amount of time that you spend reconciling it is going to be much lesser when you use a software compared to a manual system. Okay? So that's really what you take out of this particular slide. And when considering a software, being in the legal business, and I hope everyone who's joined me today is in this legal business of being a legal practitioner. There is good news that there is one such thing called as legal accounting software that does very particularly work towards managing the legal aspects of your business, the trust reconciliations, the way it's supposed to be captured and reported. The general reconciliation, of course, you can, if you're only doing general reconciliation, I'll be honest, you can certainly use a software that's meant for general accounting. But as a legal firm, you have this wonderful opportunity to use this vehicle called a retainer. And all it takes is for a little bit of discipline and prudence to manage those trust funds and the retainer funds in a legally compliant way. And once you've done that, it really saves you the time, effort, and headache of having to follow up for payments. One of the biggest problems that legal firms have is having to follow up for client payments. Utilizing this vehicle that you have, and one of the very few professions that has this facility of being able to ask for money in advance of doing the work, really empowers you as a professional, as a business professional. So it's just a matter of having the right discipline to tell the story of those journals and ledgers and making sure that you're appropriating all those funds in the right way. That's all it takes for you to have very much the confidence of running a profitable business. Okay, so bottom line comes down to compliance, the accountability of a business ownership, the analytics to give you the data that you need to make informed decisions, and the peace of mind and ease of use, especially with systems now being available uh, on the cloud, keeps it not only compliant, but very convenient as well. Um, we certainly have used this quite a few times as reference, and we would certainly encourage you to, of course, search this up on Google or any search engine. Uh, I'm not quite sure what are the search engines we have, but let's just say Google for now. Uh, spot audit is a very common searched term, and you do have specific bookkeeping guidelines, um, which is a phenomenal document that the pr province of Ontario has had put together. Other provinces, if we have legal professionals joining from other provinces, the individual jurisdictions have done a great job of documenting this. But the one document that I would recommend certainly is the bookkeeping guideline. And there are two documents, one for paralegals and one for lawyers. Very minimal differences. Uh, I think the lawyers won't talk about real estate and uh, certain other transactions. But both those documents pretty much tell you what is expected out of you as a business, legal business owner from a perspective of compliance. So please do take the time. I believe it's about a 60 to 70 page document. 
you can easily download it and skim through it. So I'm going to shift gears with another 10 to 12 minutes left in the clock here to, once again, as I mentioned, utilize ULaw practice as just as a means of demonstrating the capabilities that these legal accounting softwares provide you, uh, you know, ULaw being one of them, and the ease in which you can actually generate these compliances. Okay? And yeah, please do visit our updated website. We have ulaw.io. That would be the quick message from the sponsors. All righty, so I'm going to quickly shift gears utilizing my practice account. Okay, I'm going to turn off this brand new feature in ULaw, which is the notification. I'm going to use the example of a pragmatic situation in a law firm's life, which is accepting a client, let's go through the quick retainer process, and then also work on the reconciliation process of that. So prior to which, I will go ahead and I will quickly check my reconciliation status. Perfect. As of today, I'm all good. This may be a wonderful situation because I've caught up and I'm reconciled. Okay, so every transaction that I put in needs to reflect here. So let's go ahead and create a client. As I mentioned, the data that you enter on a practical basis about your client, about your business, is pretty much what is captured. They're not asking for anything else. A ledger or journal is not asking for your address, where you spend your marketing money on, right? None of that. Well, the expense book kind of does reflect that, but let's go ahead and create a client, Mr. Harry King. I apologize, I couldn't come up with a better name this afternoon. The source of contact, a very important component of a client intake document. I'm just going to say family. Of course, I'll put in a quick correspondence address. And let's get going. I'm going to skip the whole component of conflict search and all of that for purposes of today's demo. I want to be respectful of your time. And uh, let me just go ahead and create a matter. And just to make this fun, I'll give you a couple of minutes if you want to share with me a type of area of practice. If you want to put that on the chat window, I'll take whoever puts that first, I'll take that as the area of practice. So anybody who's listening, type in an area of practice and we'll use that as an example. Could be anything, small claims, family. So I'll leave that to you. All right, we've got the first answer, LTB. Let's do that. Thank you. So the first thing when you do when you create a matter is, of course, you can park this as a type or area of practice so that you know where you're making your revenue from, especially if you're a legal firm that offers multiple areas of practice. And let's say this is Harry versus this Stefan or Boris, and this could be eviction of tenant, okay? Or this could be a commercial LATB situation. Could be anything. I'm just going to pick and choose something easy. The first step is you would sign a retainer agreement. You can use the samples that we have. You could have your own samples. You could bring that in. Many different things. So let's skip that component. That you, let's agree that you've signed up a LATB matter. I'm going to choose, let's say, $665. That's a commonly used number that I use, 565 for uh, Ontario, 500 plus tax. Um, and then, let's say, $100 disbursement. Okay? So the first thing you would tell, the, you know, let's assume that Harry has just provided you with that Retainer. You've signed the retainer, it's given you a check. 
Now you've got to tell your books, or you've got to write it down, that you've got this, so that you can compare that with when that check actually hits your financial institution. So how do you tell you all that? You know, it's a retainer, simple English. Tell us exactly the date that was received, because that's important. So let's say we got it today. Or actually, let's backdate this to earlier this week. And let's say you got the 665. Then everything that's being asked here, and there's a method to the madness, because these are components that are also being asked by the Law Society audit documents. So for example, a ledger, a trust ledger, is asking you for this information. That's what we're asking you for. So a check number that's being asked in a journal, what was the method of payment? Now this is for your own sanity. What check number was it? So let's say you do have that check still in your drawer that you know exactly which file it was pertaining to. Right. Depositing it into the appropriate trust account. I'm assuming Roger Moore is with TD. With the trust account that ends with 123. How so naive. And let's provide a retainer receipt. So that's easy as that to tell the bookkeeping system that you just received $665 from Harry for this LATB matter for 665 through a check 5677. That's the story right there. Okay? And you can generate a routine receipt, but I'm going to skip that. All right. Now, so everyone knows it. You know it. Your bookkeeping system knows it. Hopefully, the bank reflects it, and hence TD would know it, because now it becomes their liability that they have the 665 on your behalf. But it's in a trust account, so it's completely not your business's money yet. Now you've got to earn it. And that's this whole prudent, lawfully compliant manner of steps that you have to take. And what is that? Is you dock it, disperse, and invoice. The invoice needs to contain something, right? If your client is happy with you just telling them, I did work, and then you charge them 665, if that's what's in your retainer letter, then, you know, Go for it. Just put that in the docket, and that's it. But it's not the real right way to do it. Your customer is going to ask you for some explanations. So really, depending on how you dock it, you could do this on a billable time, flat rate, contingency. There could be many different strategic ways that you position your fees, but they have to be in agreement with that retainer letter that you just signed up. I'm going to assume it's a flat rate. So I could say initial meeting, I'm not charging by docket. I'll have another event. So I'll say this happened on the 24th. Initial call. Client discussed an ATB matter. Signed retainer agreement. And I'll apply. And I'll say document drafting, court forms filled out. Let's say I'm not even, again, not going to charge by docket. And I'll go into the final one. And I'll say small claims. Completed, and here I'll say application fee filed, documents, I'm just making this up. All right. Now, of course, you can toggle this as a flat rate. And let's say it's $500. And I only have a few more minutes left, so I'm going to quickly go in and add that disbursement as well. So you've got the retainer, you've done your dockets, you're certainly not charging by the, uh, you know, each billable event. It's a flat rate docket. Now some legal professionals just encapsulate all of this in a single docket. Sometimes it's just easy, I guess, bookkeeping. So there's many different styles that each legal professional takes, and we are accommodative of all of those. Let's say we have a disbursement. 
as you know, you are very much available with the $100 left. You can very much pay this from trust, so you don't have to deal with reflecting it in an invoice and recovering it. But the most often thing that I've seen is people paying out of their general account and recovering it. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to say on the 28th, I had an application fee, and there was $100 tax exempt. And because we're also a business accounting software, and that's what most of the legal accounting softwares are, they manage both the legal aspect of your client-related transactions as well as your office-related transactions. If you paid this on behalf of your client, how did you pay for it? That's the question here. And who did you pay this to? So this could be the Ministry of Finance, paid from your general account, as a check, and you can print the check too. So the top part is where you're dispersing the client. The bottom part is you telling your own business how did you pay for it. Because I'm sure you want to know that when you see that $100 being taken out of your general account and you don't know what it was for. That's why the reconciliation helps. Now the last step, of course, is generating that invoice. We do offer pre-bills, which I highly recommend, but for purpose of time, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to jump right into generating that invoice. And I will quickly adjust the sales ID that I have here. Because ULOG can send you or does send you every time you input that in, which is in your settings. Very important piece of information which is the eligible trust transfer. In this case, it is $665. Okay, so here's the 665 Now comes the last step to make your money, which is the trust transfer. So docket, disperse, invoice, make this your money, do the trust transfer, and that's the pending eligible trust transfer. Okay? So you can either click on the question mark, and again, this is the legal lingo is trust invoice payment transfer. Let me go ahead and do that. And here's the $100 disbursement and the $565. Oh. The $100 disbursement, the $565 legal fee, moving it from my trust account into my general account. Now, this is where you're telling the accounting software or your bookkeeping system that you've done it. Assuming that you already have done it in real life, moving it from one account to the other, let's say from within TD. And if you're in Ontario, if you've done this, and I've done this in many demos, if you do do an electronic fund transfer, you are required to fill out a Form 9A, which we offer to you. Just enter the bank information. All righty. Now if I do my reconciliation, let's assume this is the only thing that's happened to me this entire month. But if I were to do my reconciliation, this is what you should see as part of your reconciliation, which is, as of today's date, which is the 28th of August, assuming I open my bank statement, Assuming that I reconciled everything up till August, till date, I should see the balance okay, and you basically compare you're saying, do you see that retainer of six sixty five being deposited because of the retainer? Yes, maybe it's not the twenty eighth or maybe it's not the 24th. Maybe you entered it 24th. The bank reflects it on the 25th. So you can change it. As long as it's within that time period, you're okay. Those are the only two transactions. And you can even re preview it. You can do this on a daily basis so you can get caught up. Once you've previewed the transactions, We reflected in blue. 
So the more blue lines you can add, let's say there are two blue lines for every day, you have 10 blue lines at the end of the week that you have to reconcile. That will relate to 40, and as long as you see blue lines, you can confidently just check these boxes because you know that you've already dealt with it. So come to the end of the month, you don't even have to deal with these transactions because you've done it almost on a daily basis. All you do is put your bank balance and you hit the reconciliation document. And here is the preview that you've done on a daily basis. It has all the components, the four different sections, your bank balance, your clear transactions, your trust listing, and your final comparison of the ledger between the financial institution and your bookkeeping system. Okay, And this is the document that you sign on a monthly basis. The same thing applies to your general. Now, because you've already managed, here are all the transactions that are reflected in your general account. Of course, there are more to this simply because there are more transactions. And the ones in green are the ones that you've imported from a bank statement directly. So you go through each of these. And this is what happens. If you've not reconciled in time, then you have to deal with these number of transactions, including the Harry King 665 that shows in blue because you've already accounted for it as part of your trust reconciliation. And that's the added advantage. Whereas these black transactions, you have not yet compared it against the bank. Okay? So you carry out the same step. But once you've done the reconciliation, as part of audit readiness, let's quickly generate the trust ledger. So you generate this monthly trust ledger and let me choose, uh, I will choose monthly. Click a button. Well, that's processing. I'll do the general. Or let me just stick to trust. I'll go ahead and do my journals as well. I'm going to do the trust receipt journal. And my trust payment journal. And here's your trust ledger for the month of August across all the clients and their trust balances. You can clearly see Karen has $500 in her trust balance. You just got a retainer and nothing else has happened. Whereas for our friend Harry King, clearly sees that you've got the retainer, that was 665 And this is exactly the template in which it's expected. You had a $100 disbursement taken out. That was part of this invoice that you generated. So people can just say, why did you take that $100 out of that trust account? But well, you can clearly say, hey, that was because I had included it in my invoice 3262. So where is that invoice? You go into your system and you bring that invoice up. Which file was it? It was 596203. You see, go into the matter, Reprint that invoice, show it to your auditor. It's as simple as that. So show me the journal. There you go. Oh, that's still the ledger. Okay, so here's the journal. As I mentioned, they do ask you for the method. It's not just important to tell them the amount. So if you look at our friend Harry King, for the eviction matter, how did he pay you? He paid you through that check. Okay, and once you've reconciled that, you can do your general. Pretty much that translates into your HST, your taxes. So in this case, we received that $65 from Harry King. That needs to be accounted for. Once accounted for, it needs to be told in the story through this book of a HSC report. So here's that $65 that you did capture and you got paid. 
And here are some of the HST that you've paid out of your business. There's some accounting work that you paid. There's uh, another credit card payment, some stamps that you purchased. You've purchased and you've paid HST. Compared single document, you now know you owe the government six ninety five. And that's what you set up in your bank and you make that payment. Once you've reconciled your general account, when you generate your profit and loss, you're very certain of the money that's come in. Clearly tells you family law was sixteen hundred, immigration was two thousand, and you had a profit of six grand this month. So wrapping this up with the uh, very limited time that I have, I apologize that I have gone over time. Today's webinar topic, once again, was on trust and general reconciliation demystified for one hour of professionalism CPD credits in the provinces of Ontario, British Columbia, and New Brunswick, and hopefully driving home the fact that if you can find a way to choose the right support tools that can help you reconcile on a timely basis, then you're definitely setting yourself up to be audit ready right from day one and to have that peace of mind of business ownership and not have to worry about it and have that linger over your mind on a daily basis. Generating the trust and gender reconciliation report gives you that peace of mind audit readiness, as well as the ability for you to be certain of your revenue and expenses for that particular month. Okay? And with that, I will pause this webinar. I'll stop the recording and maybe wait for any questions that you may have. If this is too late and you want to ask us, please email us at support at ulawpractice.com and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. There's a question about the analytics, and I've just brought it up. So this is what that analytics ends up being. So for today, we've got 565 from our LATB matter, because that's the legal fees. And the expenses are the client-related expenses. So it's really not a revenue per se, because it's a recoverable revenue, because you've had that expense. So if you really do an expense chart for today, you are going to see that $100 that you've paid on behalf of your client. So that pretty much in and out nullifies itself, leaving you with the 565. So this is what the analytics can do for you once you've reconciled, once you've confirmed that that's the exact amount of money that got entered into your general account. And see, now you can make those important business decisions, saying, how does this compare to my expense category, let's say, for the entire month? As you can clearly see fees paid for client was 592 out of which $100 went out today. So hopefully that answered that question. All right, so if there are any more questions, well, thank you so much for your time. Hope this was your time well spent. We look forward to seeing you in our next webinar next week at 2 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Have yourself a fantastic weekend ahead.